Order. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Uh, today the committee is holding our first oral evidence session in, into the membership of the House of Lords uh, inquiry. And this inquiry will examine the arrangements for the appointments to that House, its size and composition, and the effectiveness of its role in relation to the House of Commons. And we're joined by two expert witnesses on the subject this morning, who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves uh, for the record, starting with Professor Russell, please. Uh, yes, I'm Professor Meg Russell. I'm the Director of the Constitution Unit at University College London. I'm Philip Norton, Lord Norton of Louth. I'm Professor of Government at the University of Hull. I'm also Convener of the Campaign for an Effective Second Chamber. Thank you both. My, my first question is to Professor Russell, if I may. Very straightforward question. What functions do second chambers generally play in political systems? Mm. Not as straightforward a question as you might present. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are many, many second chambers around the world. Um, I checked for my students last uh, month, and the Interparliamentary Union lists 190 uh, national parliaments around the world, of which 78 are bicameral. So there are 78 second chambers around the world. They exist in large countries, small countries, uh, presidential democracies, parliamentary democracies, and they themselves are very varied. So um, it might interest you to know um, that only 20 of those 78 are entirely directly elected. Um, around 44 include some members who are not elected at all, and then you get members who are elected by councillors or by sub, sub uh, national parliaments and that kind of thing. So they are a very, very diverse set of institutions in a very diverse environment. Um, a few things that they have in common, um, many of them under over-represent minorities in some way. So quite a lot of them represent territorial units. I mean, you'll, some of you will be familiar with the US um, Senate where every uh, state has equal representation. That kind of model is quite common. You look at places like Australia, similarly, um, even less populous states have equal representation. And that is also reflected in some other models. So you could say that the root of places like the House of Lords is that the upper classes who were a minority were overrepresented. So that sort of overrepresentation of minorities of some sort is quite common. Um, but generally, I would say they do four things, and it is, of course, a, a, a generalization over so much diversity. They bring a different form of representation on the whole. So while you have a lower house which is elected usually, well, I mean, there are different electoral systems, of course, as well. Um, but members of the second chamber in some way represent a different dimension a lot of the time. Um, one thing that they really all do is um, bring second thought to the process, particularly of legislation. So um, you've got a second set of eyes on bills before they become law, which means that um, it irons out some of the risks of policy being made too, too fast without adequate thought. It allows a bit more time and space in the process for uh, people to consider the implications after it's been to the first chamber, for example, groups outside the parliament um, and the media and the public in general will look and see, does this look sensible? Have they, uh, have they found any problems with it? And the second chamber is often a place to fix those kind of problems. Um, so those are kind of very generic um, functions. That, that by their nature, second chambers are often a bit more independent of the executive than first chambers, because as far as I'm aware, there's only one country in the world where the second chamber can vote no confidence in the government. So that gives you a bit more freedom um, to you know, perhaps challenge the government a bit, even if you're on the government benches in the second chamber. And of course, they expand parliamentary capacity generally. You know, you've got more people. Uh, you can have more committees, you can do more investigations, that kind of thing. But they're very varied in terms of the, the powers that they have, the kinds of committees that they have, the kind of questioning procedures that they have. Um, sorry, that's a rather long answer. No, You're going to want me to do better on the rest. No, that, that's <laughs> quite, quite to finish. I wonder, Lord Norton, if you want to comment yes, maybe um, on that, but also <laughs> on the specific, specifics of the House of Lords and its current role. Yes. Well, I think it flows from what Meg is yeah. saying, because the key point is that what we're talking about are second chambers so it's the relationship to the first that's fundamental that shapes them and I think looking at those that exist there are three broad categories you've got those that are complementary to the first chamber so you seek to add value which I'll come mm -hmm. to there are those that are conflicting if you like the mischievous because they can stand in opposition to the first 
And there are those that may be superfluous because they're replicating what the first is doing. So the first is adding value, the, first, the second would be value detracting, and the third would be adding no value at all. And I think the value of the Lords is it falls in that first category, that its relationship to the first chamber is essentially complementary, that it seeks to fulfil functions that the House of Commons may not have the time to fulfil or may not have the will to carry out. So it's really taking on particular tasks that add value to what the uh, Commons is doing. Now, clearly that is most preeminent, I think, in terms of legislative scrutiny, mm. in that the Commons is the primary chamber, the Lords accepts that, so the Commons is entitled to determine the ends of legislation, it decides on the principle. <coughs> the Lords works within that to see whether the detail can be improved, so if you like, the Commons determines the ends of legislation, the Lords will focus on the means, with a view... I think both houses would be agreed in this purpose is to ensure good law. Mm. So law that is well intentioned, so there's a clear <clears throat> principle that's agreed, that it's well drafted, so it delivers on what it's intended to achieve in terms of the way it's drawn up, mm. and then that it's well implemented. Well, the Commons preeminently is geared to that first function because the Commons is entitled to determine what is legislation for, what should it do. The Lords will focus on how to deliver it. Uh, that's what we focus on. I think we could also expand our role in the third, because I think there's a real role for the Lords in terms of post-legislative scrutiny. I think that would play to our strengths by expanding the role, but it would all contribute to that goal of good law. So excluding present company here, and <clears throat> to what extent do both of you think that the House of Commons relies upon the House of Lords um, to carry out detailed um, scrutiny <coughs> legislation. Um, Philip will have his own views on 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 that. I, which 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 might suggest that it that it does rather too much. I, I suspect. Um, I would say there's 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 a bit more to it than that. Mm. I mean, you do you you hear these complaints often that <coughs> um, the Commons doesn't scrutinise properly and all the proper scrutiny is done in the Lords. I'll leave Philip to comment on that, maybe if that's not unfair, and say. That, that's certainly not the whole story. Mm. I mean, the whole point of bicameralism is that you look at things twice. I ask and it provocatively. The, yeah, that the, the two chambers look at things in a, in a different way. And the House of Lords does, I think, fit um, some of the things that I said in my, in my opening about what second chambers bring, in that it does bring different perspectives. I think in two mm. crucial ways. It's not so much, you know, again, if I say to my students, what are, the, what are the key differences between the Commons and the Lords? They will often say elected versus appointed, obviously. I think some of the key differences are actually more important than that, which is the presence of a large number of people who don't take a party whip, um, who each bring their own sort of individual um, value to the process, uh, but also generally the lack of a government majority, which very much changes the dynamic. And then, of course, as Philip has said, the House of Lords accepts that it's the secondary chamber, not the primary chamber. The House of Commons sort of does set piece debates and sets the kind of political lines on legislation. The House of Lords will look at the detail. Um, I do think that in that dynamic as to whether the Commons leaves things to the Lords, <coughs> Sometimes it actually does so deliberately mm -hmm. in a way which sometimes I think is a bit unfair on the Lords because if there is a, um, if there's something politically controversial in the House of Commons um, which perhaps members of the government's own backbenchers are not very happy about, um, there may be rumours of a rebellion. Sometimes that rebellion won't even happen. Um, and then, you know, you might say, mm. supposing a select committee had recommended a certain thing that the mm. government hadn't listened to, for example, that thing might get taken up <coughs> in the House of Lords, which might try and push the government. And I think sometimes members of the House of Commons say, let's leave it to the Lords. Hopefully they'll sort it out <laughs> because the Lords is less in the, in yeah. the limelight. It can do Very things right. um, in, a, in the sort of less controversy associated with it. And sometimes the government in that, slightly less um, public environment will be prepared to compromise and then bring something back which MPs will be satisfied with. So the, 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 the relationship between the two is very complicated, I think. And I would uh, take issue with the terminology, because to say relies on suggests that 
um, it's, well, we're not going to do it, we'll hand it over to the Lords. And I don't think it should be seen in that light. Mm. I think it seemed more positive in terms of the functions of each House. The Commons has a particular job to do. The Lords has a somewhat different role to fulfil, which complements what the Commons is doing. So I don't think we should see it in terms of the Commons, oh, we want to do, don't want to do that, we'll hand it over to the Lords. The Commons has got tasks which necessarily throw from the nature of the Commons. It's an elected chamber, it's got certain priorities. Members must focus on those. So the Lords will be doing different things which complement what the Commons is doing. So I think one needs to see it in that sense that we've each got, each House has respective roles <coughs> and it's sort of uh, strength through unity of both doing um, uh, discrete tasks which contribute to the whole, which, as I say, is, is, is good law. So I think it should be seen in those terms. We are fulfilling uh, functions which are um, appropriate to each chamber. So, so, it is, yeah. if, I, if I might add, I think it is connected as well to the thing that I said at the start about the, just the natural process of the passage of time. So mm. needing time to, to, to ruminate and consider and consult on some of the points that have been raised in the first chamber. So... I'm due to be writing a small piece on the um, levelling up and regeneration bill, uh, which has obviously just gone through. There was quite a lot of controversy in the Commons on that bill. Um, there were um, 95 amendments in the Commons, most of them at report as a result of government concessions. Um, but then in the House of Lords, there were a further 424 government-sponsored amendments mm. So the government is often using the House of Lords as a space to fix some of the controversies on its own legislation, maybe fix some of the problems that have been pointed out in the Commons but there hasn't been time to act upon. What it looks like is that the Lords is having this enormous impact and that the Lords is having the fights with the government, but often they are the same kind of controversies that have been going on since the bill has been in the House of Commons and the Lords rather gets the blame some of the time, I think. You know, they, they, they often, you know, the Commons draws its legitimacy from being elected, doesn't it? And what gives the scrutiny role of the House of Lords its legitimacy and authority? I think the, the nature of the composition, because legitimacy is to do with what's logically appropriate, lawful, seen as a, a, appropriate. So if the Lords are seen as you know, the right body for um, engaging in detail legislative scrutiny and is popularly accepted as such, so the first is slightly philosophical about what's right, but the second is empirical in terms of how people see it. So it's ensuring that you've got the people who are deemed to be most appropriate for fulfilling that particular function. So if the Lords has got particular functions which are different from the Commons, then you find the people who are most appropriate for doing that mm. and ensuring that there is popular acceptance that those people are the most appropriate for fulfilling the task. So it's actually two, two elements. First of all, ensuring they are the most appropriate people and secondly, making sure that it's recognised that they are. I've, I've written about the legitimacy of the House of Lords and described it in three terms which are used by academics. The idea of input legitimacy, mm. um, the, the people who go into it and make it legitimate, output legitimacy, which is what it produces, what it does, and then there's a third idea of throughput legitimacy, which is the process by which it does it. So the House of Lords in some regards is challenged on input legitimacy. It doesn't have the the sort of democratic legitimacy that you refer to that the House of Commons does, but obviously it does potentially have the legitimacy of experts being put in or whatever. There are other forms of input legitimacy. But if what it does is valued, and if the way it does it is valued through perhaps less partisan debate, more deliberative, you know, um, sort of careful um, consideration, then it can gain legitimacy through what it does and what it produces as well as what goes in. And I think it relies on that quite a lot. But at the input legitimacy end, it is that th th there are challenges and there are particularly, I mean, we're going to come on and talk about the appointments process. I think the, there are problems in the, the appointments mm. process which potentially undermine those other forms of legitimacy because there's too much focus yes. on the problems of the type of people that get there and how yes, they I, get and there. I think, I know, thank you for that. And I think, Lord Norton, it takes me on to your, your quote about the Lords that form should follow function. Could you explain what you meant by that? Well, it follows from what I was just yeah. saying, because you set up a body to fulfil particular tasks, particular functions, having established what it's there for, you <laughs> then determine who are the most appropriate people to fulfil those functions. I would also add at the same time, 
you give it the resources and the procedures to enable it to fulfil <coughs> those functions. So I think the composition is necessary. It may not be sufficient to ensure that the tasks you expect of that body are fulfilled. But it essentially does it that way round. So if you like, you start with what it's there <coughs> to do. You then think about who are the most appropriate people to do it. Um, and the two should come together, which is Meg's point about input-output legitimacy. You shouldn't see them as conflicting, which is you tend to get this um, debate, which is at cross-purposes between the input and the output of the House of Lords. I think you should put the two together um, because they uh, should come together in terms of recognising that the, the way the body is chosen is appropriate <coughs> for the work that it does. Uh, thank you both. Um, Ronnie Cowan, please. Uh, no, thanks, Chair. Just a follow-on from that. We've seen in the recent weeks the Prime Minister appoint uh, a member to the House of Lords who immediately takes up a senior position within the government. Does that blur the lines between Commons and Lords? <laughs> Not, well, it depends how senior they are. Um, you need some ministers in the Lords to represent uh, the government. They may be chosen from the existing ranks of peers, and uh, there's a, a practice of succeeding, uh, successive prime ministers drawing in people uh, from outside uh, to fulfil those ministerial roles. Now, you can argue the value of the House is the quality of the scrutiny of those uh, ministers. I remember... Uh, George Young, now Lord Young of Cookham, saying when he was at the dispatch box in the Commons, he generally took the view he was well briefed and probably knew more about the subject than those questioning him. He said when he was at the dispatch box, because he joined the government in the Lords, he thought it was the other way round. So you can really get detailed scrutiny of ministers. I think that's the value of the exercise in terms of having uh, the nature of the House, but there's a recognition, obviously, that most senior ministers will necessarily. Uh, be in the Commons. In terms of having, a, having an unelected person now in the government, does that not blur the lines between what we think we have? There, there, there are always mm. ministers in the Lords. You know, there's a, there's a Lords minister in most government departments because you need somebody to answer questions and take bills through, but they are normally more junior yeah. ministers. So it's the, it's the, it's the status um, yeah. of David Cameron. It's the appointment of a, of a Foreign Secretary from the Lords, which is unusual. Um, and it does raise some questions about how scrutiny is going to work, um, which were raised um, most, um, most obviously when Peter Mandelson was put into the Lords by Gordon Brown. There were similar kinds of questions asked. I'm not sure about blurring the lines between the two houses. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite common, as Philip says, for people to be appointed to the Lords in order to do a ministerial job. Um, but it is an unusual appointment. It's the first... Um, foreign secretary that we've had from the mm -hmm. from the Lords for a very long time, and it was controversial when it last happened um, uh, under Margaret Thatcher. Carrington, who, mm. who has resigned in '82, but that was over. So, looking at the membership of the Lords, then, uh, how do you think the membership of the Lord affects its ability to carry out its functions effectively? Well, I would argue uh, very effectively on the whole, because of the nature of the membership, and I think that's what. Uh, why the appointments process is important to try to <coughs> ensure that we do actually deliver the membership that is appropriate to fulfilling the functions we've outlined. So that point uh, that's in the submissions about house of experience and expertise, making sure we actually deliver on that. Now, if you look at the membership of the house, um, actually this morning, I, as an exercise, I actually got our members' photo book to just randomly look, so I just opened it at the the middle, which happen to be women crossbench peers. And that gives you some idea of the flavour of those who are appointed. So Baroness Hollins is a professor of psychiatry. Uh, Tanny Gray-Thompson, Baroness Gray-Thompson, the Paralympian. Uh, Baroness Teach, of course, you, you've seen because uh, for the pre-appointment hearing a very distinguished uh, lawyer, Baroness Finley of Landaff, professor of uh, palliative care. Baroness Butler Sloss, who of course was the first woman Lord Justice of appeal uh, president of the family division of the high court largely responsible for the human rights uh, act baroness brown of cambridge who's an engineer um uh, late baroness boothroyd of course um so that just gives you a flavor um 
of some of the ones, uh, there's Baroness Hogg, who was the first chair of a FTSE 100 company, um, Baroness Casey, who's well known for her inquiry into homelessness, and then the culture of the Metropolitan Police following the Sarah Everard case. Yeah, so that gives you an idea, that's just to illustrate what we should be working towards I, as the norm. I don't think it was a question of the fact that there are some very capable people in the House of Lords. I've had a great pleasure of working with Ben and the APPGs, and they bring a lot to the table. But there's 817, and I think that's the issue that people have. They look at the size of it, and amongst that 817, you are, by necessity, or you are, by design, going to have a lot of people who are not contributing yeah. in the way that members you've just listed. Can I comment yeah. on this? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say I think your question was how does its membership affect its, its, its ability to carry out its functions? And I think I would say three things, um, three distinct things in relation to that, and I'm sure there are many others that one could mention. The first one is what Philip has said, that the, the nature of the quality of some of the members makes it... Um, a very challenging environment, as Philip has already said, for ministers who may face experts standing up and asking them questions about their ministerial brief who've been working in that field for, for, for decades. But then second, something that I emphasised already, which is that um, the partisan balance of the chamber greatly affects how it works. The fact that you have a large number of members who are not taking a whip, uh, who are basically there to listen to the debate and work out which side they're on, and the fact that um, the government is not short of a majority, I think, greatly affects the, the <coughs> tone of the debate and keeps it... Um, political point scoring is at a minimum and persuasion and evidence is at a maximum. That's not as a, that's <coughs> not as a result of it being expert, but as a result of the government not having a majority there. Yeah. But then the third thing I would say is what you're alluding to, really, in terms of the way that its um, composition affects its ability to do its job, that I think its ability to do its job is increasingly compromised uh, by problems around its composition, by the fact that it is too large, um, by the fact that people get into there through an appointments process that the public does not have faith in, I think actually undermines its ability to do its job and some of those better yeah. features... Um, so the House of Lords is sort of doing a battle um, in the minds of the public to, on the one hand, be trying to do a good job, but actually the appointments process, which is not anything to do with the chamber itself, which is out of its hands, is undermining its legitimacy in the eyes of the public, and that, that, that is a problem. It weakens the House of Lords, um, and it weakens Parliament as a whole, and politics, I would say, Yeah, I general. agree with that, because that's the key distinction I was going to draw, because it doesn't affect the capacity to fulfil its functions. So we've got the members who are there to fulfil uh, the functions, because the, the Lords can do what it does and do well because of the composition, <coughs> because of procedures. In terms of composition, as Meg says, there are two elements. There's the collective composition, the political composition. No government has an overall majority, and that does affect it. Over 20% of the members are cross-bench um, peers. Um, um, at the same time, it's the individual membership, those who have got particular experience or expertise that come together. So you've got uh, that, and then you've got the procedures, which are very different to the commons that members are able to use to effect to uh, fulfil the functions. So the nature of the House and the, uh, the procedures facilitate um, a very different culture to the commons. Now, in the commons, I would say it's a culture of assertion. Ministers know they're going to get their way. In the Lords, it's much more a culture of justification, because ministers can not know necessarily they've got to carry the House with them, they've got to work on it, they've got to listen to what's been said. Other members are persuaded by those who clearly know what they're talking about. So it's much easier for the Lords, I would say, than the Commons to develop cross-party allegiances, to ally with the crossbenchers, to put um, pressure on government to listen to what's been said in <laughs> debate. So the problem is a wider one, which is exactly the point Meg has made in terms of both appointments and sheer size mm -hmm. that affect how we are seen rather than what we do. As the membership, as you read out there, is academic, it's informed, it's intelligent, <laughs> the question is, does that reflect our society at large? Are there people from other backgrounds, maybe not from academia, who should be in the House of Lords to bring their lived experience into the, that debating chamber? Oh, that would add value to what we do. I think what the Lords does, it does well, but we could do it even better. Uh, one of the points I worked into the, um, the private members' bill I introduced last session on nominations was to include the capacity for 
the Appointments Commission for HOLAC to have regard to the diversity of the population of the United Kingdom because we benefit from people who come from a range of backgrounds with different experiences. So that is particularly important when you're looking at experience because everybody's got some experience. But it's, it's how distinctive is that experience that will add value rather than duplicate. So you have individuals who come in who have had lived experience of different forms. Um, you know, Lord Bird who founded the big issue, things like that, knows about homelessness. So all these uh, people drawn from a range of backgrounds like that uh, add value. And I think there's a, there's a role for HOLAC in being more proactive in identi going out and identifying the sort of people you've mentioned rather than simply being reactive in relation to names that are put forward. And of course that page that your book fell mm. open at, uh, it was a lovely page, but it was not a, an, it was not a representative page because they're organised in, <laughs> in groups. I mean, you're, yeah. you're looking at, as you say, cross-bench cross bench women as women. it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the party benches, you'd find a, a, a rather different mix. You'd find a lot of former MPs on the Labour <coughs> side. You'd find people who come from the trade unions. You find people who come from business, etc. So mm. it's, it's, you know, it, there's more to it than that. Yes, I'm going to resist the temptation to do <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, review just going uh, through them because in a way the problem is not those who've got the expertise who are present and contribute. Mm. It, it's both those who are there who aren't contributing and your point is those who aren't members in the first place that we could usefully draw in and would add to the value of what the House uh, contributes. Thank you. Uh, John McDonald, I think. Just, just to follow up on this slide. We shouldn't be naive about this, though, should we? The government always gets its way. No matter how many ping-pongs they are, mm. the government always rolls over. So the government does have a majority up there in the end. I would say no. Um, <laughs> because, um, I mean, it, my figures are a, bit out, are, are a bit out of date, but I've studied uh, the legislative process and the, by, the, the relationship between the two houses on legislation very, very closely. Uh, tracking through bills and, in particular, defeats on bills. I mean, most of the amendments that are made in the House of Lords are government amendments, they're not defeats. But there are a large number of defeats of the government in the House. And so the question is, what happens to those defeats? Does the Lords win? And we traced very carefully um, hundreds of defeats to work out what the ultimate outcome was. Um, our data goes from 1999 to 2012, so it is out of date. And I think that the patterns may have been changing. It's something I've been wishing to do to get back defeated? to that. Has a bill been defeated? But no, because the House of Lords effectively has a convention that it doesn't defeat bills. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, occasion, mm -hmm. occasionally, very occasionally, you get things uh, defeated or withdrawn, but um, that's not the role of the House of Lords, no. really. Has On, it ever exercised its full power to delay beyond a year? No, since uh, 1949, there have only been four bills that have been enacted under the provisions of the Parliament Act. Mm. Three of those were on free vote measures. Yeah. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is because of the composition of the House and it being aware. I mean, it has these powers formally, which it could, in theory, mm. exercise, but it doesn't because it's aware of the outcry that there would be in the House of Commons, in the, in the newspapers mm. in the country, of an unelected House trying to knock down something that had been approved by an elected House. What I was going to say on the amendments was that we found that in about 40% of cases, the government actually gave in to the Lords. So you will often see something ping-ponging. You saw it on the um, levelling up and regeneration bill, which I referred to. There were a number of defeats. Um, some of them are knocked out altogether. <clears throat> Other ones, the, 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 the government comes back with some concessionary amendments and there's a compromise reach. That does happen. I think, yeah. I, think it, I suspect it happens less now than it does in the period that I was studying. Um, but it does happen, and we've seen yeah. it recently. I think the important distinction is you're getting at the, where the Lords may say, we don't want this bill. The point that Rep Meg's making is the Lords doesn't take that stance, is can we improve this bill? Can we make amendments which are acceptable to government, to everybody that actually has the intention of improving yeah. the bill? And at third reading, when we can take amendments, but you will get ministers accepting, as a result of what's happened, the bill's been improved. Yeah. So a lot of it is, is constructive engagement. I mean, the online safety bill recently would be a good example of that, where it's a discourse between the different parts of the House, proper engagement with the minister, mm. to seek to improve the bill 
not to stop the bill. And very often the amendments that are made are proposed in the end by the minister. Oh, yes. So you, yeah. don't, see, you, you yeah. don't see a clash. You yeah. see it resolved it's, through yeah. some sort of compromise. Well, rather, they never defeat a bill. They rarely delay a bill for the, for the length of time it possibly can. Do you think that's a reflection of the class they're from? That they're part of the establishment anyway? Don't they reflect their class nature? No, because the members are drawn from quite a wide range if you look at the backgrounds. Um, so it's more reg having regard to the nature of the House and its relationships. Well, they're part of the establishment. No, itself. I, um, I don't think there are a number of members who um, would be aghast at the thought. Um, so, no, it's more to do with recognising the purpose of the House, what we're there to do, to add value to what the Commons um, is doing. It would be inappropriate for the second chamber to challenge the elected first chamber. You roll over anyway. Um, uh, no, I think that's not our role. If, they, if, sure, to, sure it, if there were a Lord Macdonald, that wouldn't be happening, Lord Johnson. <laughs> uh, and I assure did, you, there will never be that. Did I, uh, did I uh, Ronnie, had you finished your question? Uh, no, yeah. very, very briefly, we reckon 784 members are considered eligible to attend. Votes maybe a maximum around 500. How many do actually need to be an effective House of Lords? I think there's a point on which here where Philip and I are in agreement, which is that there is a maximum that it shouldn't exceed, which I, I think mm. is the size of the House of Commons. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the House was, after the 1999 reform, which removed most of the hereditary peers, the House was cut down from about 1,200 members to just over 650, 666. Um, it, didn't, it certainly didn't function any worse then than it does we're now. Eight, we're we're 817. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that's a problem. And I've said for years that I think that's a problem. I've published lots of things yeah. suggesting that it's a problem. I was the specialist advisor to the uh, Lord Speaker's Committee on the mm. size of the House, where they were trying to work out how we can do something about this. I think it's an enormous problem. But I would say, in response to those who think that um, actually it's fine for it to get bigger and bigger and bigger, I would say I think it was probably functioning rather better in the early 2000s than it is now, and it had um, only just over the number in the House of Commons. Uh, I mean, we've polled the public, um, and they overwhelmingly think that the House of Lords should not be larger than the House of Commons, and I think it could function perfectly well at, at the size of the House of Commons or somewhat smaller. And in fact, I mean, it's a well-known fact, isn't it? You often see it in the newspapers that it is. It's actually the only second chamber in the world. When I talked about the diversity, one of the things which is a common feature of second chambers around the world is that they are invariably smaller than the first chamber that they sit next to. We are the only country out of those 78 where the second chamber is larger than the first chamber. And there, is, there are some good arguments. You know, there are part-time members and so mm. on, and we may come on and talk about that. It's, it's not entirely straightforward, but um, I think we would be better served by a chamber which was smaller in terms of public opinion and in terms of its ability to get its job done. And that's accepted in the Lords, because in uh, late 2016 we passed a motion unanimously saying we're too large and steps should be taken to reduce numbers, which is why the Lord Speaker mm. set up the Lord Speaker's Committee, the Burns Committee, to address the, the problem. So it's generally accepted in the Lords that we should be no bigger. We uh, are going to comments. touch on that, and I don't want us to be at risk of <laughs> cantering <laughs> through the, 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 the entire agenda of that, that answer, but I'm going to Damien Moore, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Um, just touching on that point, would there be any benefit of having full-time members rather than part-time members? I think at the moment, I mean, this is, this is very hard to document, but I think at the, at the moment there probably is something of a mixture of full-time and part-time yes. members. There yes. are some people who attend very, very regularly. I mean, obviously there are the ministers and the, the shadow ministers for a start, but there are people who are there virtually all the time. And then there are people who are there hardly ever, and then there are people who are in between. Um, so I think we do have some full-time members. I think there would be downsides. In the, you know, it's horses for courses. I think choosing what you want to do with the House of Lords in the big sense of whether you want to sweep it all away and replace it with an elected chamber and so on, it's, a very, it's an argument which is very much like the argument about different types of electoral systems. There are, there are pros and cons of different ways of doing it. Um, so I'm not saying that this is an argument against election necessarily, but I think you do need to accept that there would be downsides of a fully full-time house in that um, at the moment you have some people who are still, like some of those that Philip mentioned, 
perhaps, um, who are still active in their professions, um, and they bring that expertise into the house. And then you have many people, of course, who are retired, um, who don't wish to contribute full-time anymore, but who have a wealth of experience, and that includes people who've retired from this place. Um, it has in the past, one of the things about David Cameron's appointment that I rather like is that it's brought a former prime minister mm. back to the Lords for the first time since Margaret Thatcher died 10 years ago. I mean, it used to be commonplace. It used to be the norm that prime ministers would be appointed, like <coughs> speakers of the House, would be appointed to the Lords when they left this place. And if they turn up occasionally um, and make contributions, and I think that's valuable. I think, I think a mix of people who are full-time and of people who are more expert and contribute perhaps less, maybe because they're uh, because they're older, is actually quite a healthy thing, yes. myself. No, I think we recognise that. You do have some members who are full-time. It, it facilitates the administration of the House. The value of having members who, if you like, come in, who've got the day jobs, their areas of expertise, the value is the expertise is current. There is a set, certain danger with retired members. They were experts, but their expertise after a while might be spent. That, that is the worry, and that's a case to be raised uh, about some of the contributions. So having those who are at the forefront of their particular field, who can then come in and contribute to that, I think is extremely valuable. We recognise that. We benefit from it. That's one of the arguments against having the, the House as too small a body, a small body of full-time members. But we don't want it to be too large, we recognise we are too large, but focusing on those who actually do have something to contribute then does facilitate the work of the House and makes it qualitatively distinctive. I suppose it might be worth adding, if I may, going back to my first answer, that one of the reasons that you see so much diversity in second chambers is that a lot of countries are trying to square these kind of circles. So there are a number of countries where the, the chamber has a lot of elected members in it, but it also has an appointed element uh, which brings people in who have... Um, who have expertise outside. So, for example, in Italy, the second chamber is almost entirely elected, but former presidents of the Republic serve <coughs> ex officio. So, and in Ireland, there's a slice of um, appointed people who are sitting alongside the elected. And actually, some of the proposals, um, the, the Nick Clegg proposals and the previous proposals uh, under Labour, were trying to balance up the benefits of election and the benefits of appointment and saying that, that there, is a, there are reasons for having uh, people who are perhaps occasional contributors to, who, who add to the diversity in the chamber, and they can sit alongside people who are there more full-time. There's another advantage occurs to me, uh, coming back to the earlier question about diversity, the nature of the membership, that uh, uh, the, the fact of appointment, uh, picking up on what Meg was just saying, means you can also bring in people who may be from underrepresented minorities, things like that, who might have difficulty getting candidatures for the uh, election, but appointment means you can move fairly quickly to add to that diversity as well. Mm -hmm. So you can have a range of members from a range of backgrounds with um, expertise in particular areas that contribute to the work of the House. And just on um, participation, should there be a minimum level of participation or other activity that's monitored to justify their position in their earlier on you cited what the public <coughs> deem as acceptable for the numbers but what about what they're actually doing once they, they get in there? I think this is a very tricky question mm. actually I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure we both watch with interest Baroness Deitch's evidence to you and I, I agree with 90% of what Baroness Deitch said to you um, but one of the challenges of um, vetting people for their participation is what you do with people like the former Prime Minister's I think you may need two ways of looking at it, um, that there is a, there's a general sort of maybe minimum level of participation for, I, don't, I mean, I don't know quite how you square it, but I would see it almost as two different routes, that there are some people who are put in there because of real sort of very high achievement and who you appreciate may contribute, you know, a, a couple of times a year and that this is valuable, uh, but then that the, the great majority of people who go in ought to be going in to do a job and contributing very substantially. I don't know how, quite how you get that balance. Well, you, yes, a minimum level of participation. <coughs> you can't participate unless you attend. So, as you know, in the 2014 Act, I sort of drafted the um, 
original that became the 24 Act, uh, 2014 Act, and I put in there the provision that any member who didn't attend for a whole session, as long as the session lasted at least six months, was expelled. And so some members have gone, so mm -hmm. at the end of the last session, clerk of the Parliament was announcing who was gone from the Lords because of non-attendance. Now, there is a feeling in the House that we ought to perhaps amend it and up it slightly so that at least there is some minimum level of attendance, but then it comes into Meg's point about what that level um, should be and what form participation should take, because yes, it'd be helpful to have some members who might have experience but are only able to come in occasionally. Um, I'm not sure who these people are, because they occasionally get mentioned, oh, the one who only make one or two contributions, but um, possibly difficulty identifying those who fall in that category. Mm -hmm. So you could up the level of participation, but not to the level that it starts to eat into those who do have you know, jobs that are useful where they do actually come in and contribute. But there's certainly a feeling in the house, there's certainly uh, a view that um, we should up that requirement. Uh, so if you're required 10% you know, of attendance, something like that, it would actually remove quite a number of members who aren't uh, contributing significantly you know, at all. I think one of the biggest problems of, of, of the House is those who don't contribute and also aren't particularly distinguished, if we can put it like that. I mean, maybe, maybe if, you, if, you had a, if, you, if you had a rule of, if you, if you of 10% participation or something, Philip, yeah. maybe, maybe you could have a sort of dispensation yeah. for certain people who, ha who had brought a great deal, yeah. but those who, effectively, <laughs> those who wish to be appointed in order to have the title um, and are not interested in contributing to the House, yeah. I think are part of the problem, and that's one of yeah. the things that needs to be dealt with. We are they, they don't bring anything very obvious. They haven't contributed to this place, and they haven't contributed there, and what they want is the title, <coughs> and I, th I think that needs to be dealt with. Perhaps we could have a, another book with those people in. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have some, we're conscious of it, who are a bit like Jeremy Bentham, present but not voting. Um, so, um, that perhaps we should. Um, so we're conscious of that as well, because um, members generally are conscious of the reputational damage to the House, so we are keen to address yeah. it. We are alert to that. So um, the Lords isn't the, when it comes to reform, the Lords not the problem. It's the government persuading mm. the government to take action where legislation is required. We accept something needs to be done about the size of the House. We accept, and I agree, I accept the point made in various of the submissions to you that this is far more significant, is the appointments process in terms of public trust. Mm -hmm. And so we are very alert to that, and we think that does need reforming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Joe Gideon, please. Uh, thank you. So my question picks up on this theme. Actually, Lord Norton, you set out in your submission to this inquiry that one of the main reasons the House of Lords is able to carry out its function rests on the qualification of its members, and in particular, experiences and expertise in different sectors. Um, but there is a perception that at least some are not appointed due to their experience and expertise. Um, what is your assessment of how many members can be considered to be bringing expertise um, to the House of Lords? I've not done a quantitative assessment. I mean, obviously, in terms of experience, then every member's got experience of, of some things. So it's really um, how distinctive is the experience and to what extent would it add to the knowledge of the House by being able to draw on that? Um, obviously, with a uh, expertise, it's somewhat easier if one was going to do a quantitative study because you're looking at the formal qualifications because expertise in terms of you're formally qualified, you've studied the subject, so you are the leading figure you know, in medicine, the law, you've got the qualifications um, um, uh, to uh, uh, deliver on that. Um, now, I'm not sure you can come up with a precise number simply because um, you might have several people have an expertise in the same area. Um, so what distinguishes uh, them? And sometimes you've got um, experience that's almost hidden experience until there's a debate, you don't know what they've got to bring to bear. So I'm not sure one could have two degree, uh, two uh, precise rigidification. Um, what I would do is um, actually put greater onus on, I'd like to say HOLAG, reformed so it can be more proactive in identifying where there are gaps in 
the House in terms of its sort of knowledge base. So we need more people who've got experience of X or who are expert in Y to bring those into the House. I mean, normally when we debate a subject, peers will get to their feet, you realise they've got lived experience of that subject or they're their experts in the field. But there may be some areas where we don't have those or where, if you like, the experts are sort of retired, the knowledge is spent. So we really need to renew ourselves in that. I think that's really a job for... Um, a study that would inform HOLAC in the work it does, so it could be more proactive rather than reactive. Uh, and I think that would add to the, the wider question I expect you're coming on to in terms of trust in the institution and people having trust in the appointments process. I did do a study like that for HOLAC a number of years ago, yeah. I think it was around 2010, where we did an analysis of all of the members of the House of Lords and their backgrounds. Background, yeah. and, to, to try and indicate to them which areas were overrepresented and which ones were underrepresented. And yeah. we, obviously, there are certain areas which are very well represented. Politics, <laughs> as in people who had been MPs or had been MEPs or had been leaders of councils, very well uh, represented. The law was quite well represented. Um, then there were other things, like I remember one of them was nursing. Uh, very underrepresented. And HOLAC took this very seriously and mm. they wanted to try and plug some of these gaps. But of course, they themselves have control only over those members that they choose, who yeah. you were hearing from Baroness Deitch have been down to uh, as few as two per mm. year or yeah. even less. Yeah. Mm. They have no control over the people who are put forward by the political party. So <coughs> you know, we're maybe getting into the next phase of, of what you want to talk about, but I think giving HOLAC more control over those things and at least having more monitoring of why people are getting there and what their backgrounds are and HOLAC being able to point out we don't have any nurses. Mm. Could you perhaps think of you know, appointing some people who, or you know, whatever it is, people who understand certain areas of science or medicine yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, would be very helpful. I think that's particularly useful in identifying the gaps because as you said, you're, if you look at your list, you say more, quite a number of lawyers and things like that. Um, it's not that we've got necessarily too many lawyers because it depends where their area of expertise lies. So if you've got someone who's been a Lord Chief Justice, independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. So for example, last week we had the second reading uh, of the investigatory, investigatory Powers Amendment Bill. Well, Lord Anderson of Ipswich spoke, former independent review of terrorism legislation whose independent review earlier this year gave rise to the bill um, so uh, and we, we want to add two former members of uh, two former heads of MI5 speak so you've got that range of expertise but within the law the law you've got different areas of expertise within that so different experiences say as judges or as independent review of terrorism legislation and so on so um, and with MPs yes we the issue is we do have um, about 170 former members of the House of Commons. Now, some of those do bring distinct experience because they've served as cabinet ministers, they've been secretary general of NATO. That type of experience as a former minister can be very valuable. So it's actually distinguishing uh, within the categories. Um, Professor Russell, can I just ask the report that you did, was it enacted in, I mean, you know, did you do it in order to um, help better inform who was going to be appointed to the House of Lords and the whole access system. In a way, yeah. I mean, we were, we were commissioned by the House of Lords Appointments Commission to do this work. Um, I can send you a link if you like. I can't actually remember which year it was. I'm thinking it's maybe something like sort of 2008, 2010. Um, and, I mean, first of all, I think they just wanted to get a snapshot, a picture of what the expertise in, in, the, in the place was. It seems worth, it's an intrinsically interesting mm. question. Mm. But they were doing it because they wanted to try and ensure that there was a balance of, of, of expertise and professional backgrounds. And I think that they did act somewhat in terms of trying to pick out people who had applied um, through the crossbench route who would fill some of these gaps, but the number of, the amount of discretion that they have to actually choose anybody is very, very small. So, you know, they would also like to ensure, I think, that the place is more representative of the, you know, the territorial diversity of the United Kingdom. They would like to ensure that there's a fair balance between women and men and people of different ethnicities. But you can't do that if you're controlling yeah. only about 10% of the people who are going in there because the vast majority are controlled by the parties and they have no say over those um, appointments. Of course. 
Um, the Lord Speaker's Committee on the Size of the House recommended introducing a 15-year term limit. Um, in your view, is there any merit in introducing um, time-limited membership of the Lords? Because clearly, I mean, that might answer the, the, the question of having too much of one sort of expertise and the churn. Mm. I mean, I, I, I've already said I was a specialist advisor to the Lord Speaker's um, Committee. Um, I think there are some, some merits in the proposal, but like so many other things, there are also some potential downsides. I mean, you know, we can think of people who've been in this house for more than 15 years who are some of the most valuable members. So in, in parliamentary life, 15 years actually isn't a very long time. Um, so I mean, the, the, the main benefit and the reason that um, Lord Burns was so keen on it was that it allows you to get turnover, it allows you to get a decent number of new appointments and bring, as he would say, fresh blood into the place. Um, I had also, before working for the Burns Committee, um, produced a report um, under the auspices of the Constitution Unit looking at what was happening to the size of the House of Lords, which was obviously one of the reasons why I was appointed, and we modelled different ways of trying to get the size down and I think you can get the size down without imposing a term limit, but it means that you, can, you, you have to appoint much more slowly. So, you know, if you want a lot of refreshment on the benches, then you need to get people out the other end. Uh, but if you want to continue with life membership, and maybe, as has increasingly been happening, encouraging people to retire, uh, but of their own volition, then the appointments process will have to be slower if you're going to keep a lid on the place. And we're not managing to keep a lid on the place. Mm. This is the problem. It, continues to get bigger and bigger and the problem is not I feel and I think you haven't quite said this Philip but I think you would agree probably the problem is not insufficient people leaving it is too many people arriving yeah. <laughs> so we have to we, we have to deal with the inflow um, but you know moving people on um, after 15 years would be one way of you know the house making its contribution but the prime minister has to make their contribution we have to deal with the inflow uh, otherwise, we will never achieve um, a, st a stable yeah. membership. I may largely agree with that. I'm wary of that sort of artificial after 15 years. That's it. There are all sorts of implications in terms of recruitment who would serve that period um, as well. And I don't think it's necessary. Um, and there is the point, because we, we look at some of our members who have been there for more than 15 years think, could we really afford to lose the sheer quality of what they're able to bring to bear? So there are alternatives to it. I mean, you could have a, a, a period where you say you would normally retire after such a period, but you, there should be some sort of trigger mechanism that allowed you to stay on if you've got something to offer. But I think the, the better route is thinking of it in terms of um, the, what the Burns Committee came up with in terms of, say, the two out, one in. I mean, possibly three out, one in. It would make a difference. As Meg said, it would be rather slow. So you might have one scheme that's designed to remove uh, members, remove a tranche of members, um, but then go for the two out, one in uh, formula. And it would make a difference if you, because if you look at the number of members now that retire under the provisions of the 2014 Act and those who die, then, I mean, up to this year so far, we've had a net loss of, I think, 20, because I looked at the numbers um, so 11 peers have died but that excludes the two hereditaries because they're replaced nine have retired and that excludes the bishops and also again the hereditaries mm -hmm. um, so a net loss of uh, 20 so over time you could make uh, a difference and indeed um, post burns it was making a difference it was there was an influx of new members that then wiped out the benefit of the uh, reduction. So, yes, it, it's addressing the input is particularly important. We can then make some changes to the output side, mm. and that sort of formula, uh, I think, would address it. Thank you very much. Uh, John McDonald, please. We just have to remind ourselves at this point that we're in 2023. So, can I ask, the, is there still a role for the exempted hereditary peers in a modern parliamentary democracy. Shall I start yeah, with that? Yeah. Um, I think you have to separate um, the principal from the individuals. And I think in the case of some of the individuals, then maybe there should be. You know, there are some hereditary peers who make some good contributions mm. this is to the, the place. This the, is the principal. The principal. Uh, as a, uh, in terms of the principal, no. Uh, I mean, they're, they're there as a result of a deal, as I'm sure you know, that was done 
in the, um, when the, the, the 1999 Act was going through. The, the original bill from the Labour government was supposed to be removing all hereditary mm. peers, and there was a deal done to allow some to stay, and that was supposed to be a temporary measure, and here we still are 24 years later. So absolutely not, and I think, I think not the individuals, you have to, you have to emphasise, but I think the category is one of the things that does um, the reputation of the House mm -hmm. harm and the reputation of this Parliament and our politics harm. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've long felt um, that uh, the, the by-elections should be ended and, you know, the category should die out over time. There's been lots of pressure on, mm -hmm. uh, on that. But, you know, 24 years later, and with a house which is over 800, I now think that the time is for mm. it to go. Um, I mean, that was a controversial thing to say a few years ago, because it um, would have um, it would have destabilised the balance of the house. But the other thing is, among the hereditary peers, around 50 of them are conservatives, and only a small handful are Labour or Liberal Democrat. The rest are, are, are crossbench. And we have a problem now that the House of Lords is too big and it is too conservative. I mean, one of the problems that we've had is that over the last, um, since, since 2010, there have been, and I got the figures, um, I have got them somewhere. Um, since 2010, there have been 206 conservative appointments and 80 Labour appointments. Now, Maybe the governing party should get a few more appointments than the opposition party, but this is always the pattern, and this is one of the things that drives the ever larger size of the chamber. And if there is a change of government to a Labour government, then the Labour Prime Minister will face a terrible dilemma as to whether to you know, go into this arms race and, and, mm. and try and outnumber the Conservatives in the Lords. So an easy way, mm. actually, of balancing the numbers somewhat yeah. would be to end the hereditary I and, and, and your search, membership. It's quite excessively Liberal Democrat, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write down the Liberal Democrat numbers. That does confuse things. You mean 80, well, quite often it does, but 83. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. quite a lot, isn't it? For, you know, that, yeah, right. David Cameron just, appointed yeah. a lot of Liberal Democrats know, during know, the coalition. Exactly. Yes. Well, you, you've excited the chair, but can I just, <laughs> before yeah, you come in, Lord Norton, can I just get one thing for the record of a cab? I... In my ignorance, I did not know this until today, but the way in which they're elected, the mm -hmm. hereditary peers, are on the basis of party political elections. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, and it's when, when a peer dies, if they die from that political group, it will only be the peers of that political group that will not... Well, um, that's true of 75. Oh. 15 are elected by the whole House to be available to serve the House. I'm told, um, let's get this clear and we can take <laughs> advice on this, I'm told that the, the, ex the, the exempted peers are linked to the original party group, yeah. Yeah. Conservative 46, yeah. Yeah. Um, Crossbench 36, Labour 4, Lib Dems 4, and non-affiliated too. This, so, was, yeah. the, this was the so, balance among yeah. the hereditary so peers they are, when so they departed. That's so, right, so when, when an election comes up, the that balance will be permanently maintained. I'm, so I, I'm a great believer in the powers of conversion. So there is no there is no prospect here of someone seeing the light of socialism or environmentalism or liberalism ever to be elected if that peer that dies is a conservative or whatever. There's no no swapping. The 75 uh, are elected by the party group for that party. 15 are available to serve the whole house, so it's a whole house election, but under what's known as the Carter formula, Lord Carter, who was the Labour chief whip at the time, um, agreed that the house should elect somebody from that party to replace whatever party uh, that member is of. So you're, you're right in terms of the Is there anyone apart from you that understand, apart from you two, that understands this mechanism? Not election? any. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> I, I, um, think, uh, I thought people spoke of little else. But, um, <laughs> um, um, but coming back to the point, I, I accept uh, Meg's point, because you distinguish between the individuals and the actual principle yeah. of having them there. Understood. Understood. Yeah. It's the principle of the yeah. matter we're talking it's about. Very able, and indeed yeah, but, when Labour... Oh. When Labour lost its hereditary peers, most were actually brought back as life peers, yeah. given their ability. So, no, I mean, the House, of, the house though, itself it? the house itself accepts, I think, that Maybe. the by-election option is passed its sell-by date. Um, so we generally agreed, and Lord Grocock keeps 
bring in his private members' bill. Do you think there'd be a majority in the laws to get rid of the exemplary, the hereditary? Yes, yes. 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 The, uh, so you think a, a, a government, a, a cross-political agreement, they would get rid of the hereditary yes. and they wouldn't object? The one thing that we've tried to do it through private members' yes. legislation, because when the campaign for effect, say, change, uh, originally we produced a household reform bill over a decade ago, I drafted it to include all that we sought to achieve, and that included then getting rid of the by-election option. Right. The objection that's raised by the few hereditaries who oppose it, most don't, but the few who oppose it, is on the grounds that it is the only route that brings members into the House of Lords independent of prime ministerial patronage. Yeah. Now, if you uh, reform the process, and my current, current, pat current patronage, there yeah. was some patronage yeah. some time ago, but but depending you, on two Charles II slept yeah, with. If you reform introduce a reform of the sort that my private members were designed to introduce to give HOLAC the power, right. so you remove the Prime Minister's power. That removes the objection, the principal objections have been raised by those who seek to prevent it being abolished. Otherwise, um, even among hereditaries, there's an acceptance now that the uh, process is passed its sell by date. This is really helpful. So this rec committee could recommend the government brings forward le re yeah. legislation that would abolish the hereditary peers, and you're confident that would be passed in both houses? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, because, as I say... Well, the by-elections, yes. It yeah. would be more yeah. controversial to actually remove the yes. whole group. Yes, yeah. I okay. think, I, I mean, yeah. the, 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 the by-election provision, yes. which right. Lord Bro Grocott has tried to end yeah. year upon year upon year, it's because it's a private member's right. bill and it can be blocked uh, yeah. procedurally. It's just a minority of members who don't want it. So if the yeah. government ever took that bill up, it would go through. It would go through. So it literally... I, the, yeah. the difficulty is that now I think we may have got to a stage where we actually need to abolish the 92 seats rather than ending right. the by-elections because of the imbalance that you've indicated between the parties and the fact that we desperately need to bring the size of the chamber down. Bringing it down by 92 and bringing conservative numbers down uh, by 50 odd would actually be quite a sensible move but I think you would need to make some of the existing members life peers to be fair to the individuals who have done very good yeah. service but it would be it would be somewhere short of 92 yeah. I wouldn't like to say how many you've mapped out a useful way through I think for the committee to consider we shall see on on the next question the, the parish priest locally optimistically describes me as a lapsed Catholic so in this one is there still a role for the Lord spiritual in a modern parliamentary democracy? Oh. It's one of those past questions. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, you'll notice when they've previously attempted Big Bang reform government, it's the one thing they're always where how do we deal with the issue of the Lord spiritual? <clears throat> I mean, the plus side, if you like, is that, of course, they're the closest we've got to any member with a constituency because they can be from the point of view of their diocese. So some... Um, are represented in a city diocese, others know about rural poverty, so that provides um, some uh, uh, contribution. Um, and the interesting thing I noticed was um, I served on the Joint Committee on the House of Lords Reform Bill back in 2012. Um, now, as you might expect, the archbishops were busy arguing the case for retaining the Lord Spiritual. What struck me was other religions were doing the same because they saw the bishops as speaking for faiths mm -hmm. rather than a particular faith. So that would be the argument for uh, doing it, but it is seen as somewhat <sighs> anomalous, mm -hmm. having them as uh, members of the House where the only democracy where that is the case. It, it is interesting that they have this system whereby they consult with other faiths and they see themselves as the representative of, 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 of faith, not just the Church of England. I mean, I would say, I think this is a bit of a second order issue, to mm. be honest, because there are 26 seats, um, but they never all appear at the same time. I mean, they work on yeah. a rota. Usually there's one or two bishops there at any time, so they don't really make much impact to the size of the house, the work of the house, the outcome of decisions in the house. There is an in principle <clears throat> argument, I totally accept, but pragmatically in terms of dealing with the urgent problems that we have of the place being oversized okay. um, and ridiculed, they're, they're not often brought into the argument. So yeah. I think it, it is something that needs careful consideration, but it's not at the top of the list, I yeah. would say. And it's worth bearing in mind, because they're not the only people drawn from different faiths, because there's a whole range of faiths that members uh, represent, and we've got a large humanist association in the Lords 
as well. Um, and there's a practical problem if you were going down the route of making representation for other faiths simply because uh, of the way they're structured. The, the Church of England has the advantage of a hierarchy, um, as does the Roman Catholic uh, faith, but that's precl they're precluded from having members in the Lords by their faith, not by the Lords. There was the prospect of, I think, Cormac Murphy O'Connor coming in, but that was the church that prevented it. So some don't have hierarchies. You've got practical problems. But, I mean, that's, in effect, the point you're raising, which is more one of principle. You've both avoided the question. What's their role? What is their role? <coughs> oh. Well, uh, it's, do you do the say prayers at the start of the day, uh, does? <laughs> they say the prayer at the start of the day, John? They do, but... Um, it, that's it, is it? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> well, I just, I'm bit, honestly, what is their role? It's a good point, because, uh, in a way, um, you saw the submission from uh, the convener of the Lord Spiritual, who was making the point about what their role was not, which is not to represent, they're not there to represent the Church of England. Um, they speak, uh, they are appointed in a personal capacity, but they speak only for themselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as he stressed, there's no unified... And they don't uh, vote as a block. No, yeah. if they vote. Mm. Right. Don't, don't. I'm lost here. So their role is to enable us to have a prayer at the beginning of any session, uh, to speak as individuals, turn up whenever they want, not represent faith overall, just their individual constituencies from which they're not elected anyway. Mm. Fair enough. They are, of course, a fine example of people in the House who do have a full-time job outside the House. So that's why there's not 26 of them, because they have pretty big jobs. Uh, dis and they are, a, it is the, the, the Church of England, but they are at least distributed around England. Um, mm. But um, it, consequently, there's only one or two of them here on most days. <laughs> Oh, well, quite. Um, well, we'll see what our report says on these uh, two, two vital topics, uh, uh, Mr. McDonnell. Um, David Jones, please. Yes, Chairman. B before I ask my questions, may I make a brief declaration of interest? Of I uh, chair the Council for Arab British Understanding, which has made a submission of evidence in this inquiry, indeed, about the, the issue of faith. Thank so you very I'm, much. I won't add to that. Um, both of you have uh, identified uh, the problems with the uh, appointments uh, process. Which would you say are the principal ones? Um, I, I listed six in my submission. I don't know whether that's too many to be the principal ones. I mean, there's a base, the basic problem is that the, House of the, the Prime Minister decides how many people can be appointed, when they're appointed, on what basis they're appointed. There isn't... A, there, there isn't um, scrutiny of the, the quality of those people, only of propriety. Um, it's a very uncontrolled system. So my six items are that, well, I, I suggest that the Prime Minister's unlimited power of patronage should end, that there should be a cap on size, there should be a fair formula for allocating seats between parties and other groups, including a um, protection for the crossbench group, which has been in most sets of proposals. Um, that the House of Lords Appointments Commission's propriety oversight should be extended, as Ruth Deitch was talking about, to something like suitability, um, that, that the Commission should have oversight of diversity in the Chamber, and that its recommendations on propriety should be enforceable, because even the, you know, the limited oversight that there is of party uh, members, which is really only on propriety, we have seen even that can be overridden mm. uh, by the Prime Minister if he chooses to, so you need to you need to make that enforceable, you need to extend it to suitability, you need to do something about the numbers, and in order to do something about the numbers, you have to have a fair formula for dividing up um, between the parties and the crossbench group to avoid this pattern that you can see that, yes, Tony Blair appointed many more Labour members than Conservative members, although, to be fair, the Labour Party was underrepresented in the House of Lords at the time, but you see um, Conservative Prime Ministers over-appointing Conservative t uh, peers to the point that now we have around, is it about 100 now more Conservatives yes. than Labour, yeah. at the very point when we might be anticipating a change of government, which cr sort of starts the whole thing up again. Um, so all of, that, all of that needs to end, I think. I'd agree with Meg. I mean, that was the point of my um, House of Lords Peerage nominations bill, to work towards the three principles on which we're generally agreed, that no one party should have an overall majority, that the House of Lords should be no bigger than the House of Commons, that at least 20% of the membership should be crossbench peers. But at the same time, designed to strengthen HOLAC, give it an independence through statute, 
um, so it's not the creature of the Prime Minister and not seen to be the creature of the Prime Minister, that the Prime Minister cannot make nominations without uh, the assent, without uh, receiving advice of HOLAC, and that HOLAC itself should have clear uh, criteria for uh, assessing uh, uh, nominations, not least that the the nominee must meet a criterion of conspicuous merit and must also demonstrate uh, an ability and willingness to contribute to the work of the House and empowering the Commission itself to generate criteria having regard to the diversity of the population of the United Kingdom. Um, at the same time, um, that the process itself should be more transparent, that those making the nominations, the party leaders, uh, must inform the Commission of the criteria and the process they employ for making those nominations. So it should be clearer why they're doing it and what those members should, uh, what those members bring, those nominations bring to bear. Um, I also agree that there's a role for HOLAC, I, I want it to be more proactive, uh, to be able to create more, to nominate more crossbench peers. I think it's ridiculous they're, they're limited in the way they are at the moment because it doesn't really enable them to address the point I was making about identifying gaps, bringing in highly qualified people uh, to fulfil those. And I think there's a role for HOLAC as well in advising on the composition of the party balance and what needs to be done um, to ensure there is uh, a fair balance. Now, I regard my bill as very modest relative to public expectations because um, uh, under mine I maintain the prerogative of the Prime Minister making the nominations. It's quite clear from the data of the surveys that were carried out that you've been put in evidence to you that the public would actually prefer an independent commission to decide on who should be in the House of Lords, not the Prime Minister. So that's uh, radical. I think it would be problematic because you start to get nominations that are controversial. You've got the question of who, who is this body, in, body accountable to. Um, so I can, I can see problems if you go too far down that route. But I think you do need to strengthen HOLAC and for it to be seen to be strengthened because I think that is absolutely fundamental from the point of view of public trust. I mean, it make, makes the point in her submission, and I include it in mind, the survey that uh, the Constitution Unit commissioned about what people see as the main, most important attribute in relation to the Lords, and top was trust in the appointments process. So I think that's absolutely fundamental. Clearly you felt that the uh, appointments process should be founded in statute. Um, is it possible for a non-statutory appointments process ever to be sufficiently robust or, or, and not open to suggestions that it's, um, it can be abused? That is the problem. I see there's reference to conventions. I don't think the understandings that are being followed constitute con uh, convention of the Constitution. But if Prime Ministers uh, accepted that they should proceed on the basis of, say, three out, one in, or two out, one in, and that they're going to have regard to merit, and um, they could extend, of course, the remit of the Commission as well to include suitability and, and not confine it to propriety. Mm. So there are steps that could be taken without statute, but it would be dependent on the Prime Minister mm. accepting that. And, of course, you're committing successive Prime Ministers. Yes, they're quite that, capable of changing their minds at exactly, some time yes, in the future. Exactly. I, I very strongly agree with that, that I think that some of, some of what we've seen in recent years, I mean, both in terms of the numbers and in terms of um, just sort of riding roughshod over the propriety recommendations of HOLAC does suggest that we need to put some of this into statute. But I don't think that we should allow that to stand in the way of making improvements because, you know, it's mm. always difficult to find legislative time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. HOLAC was established by a letter from Tony Blair to the person that he was appointing as chair telling that person what he wanted it to do. The Prime Minister could tomorrow issue a new letter to the new chair saying, yes, have oversight of suitability um, as, as she wants. And the Prime Minister could make a statement you know, at, at any time saying, I commit to bringing the size of the House of Lords down. I think the Burns Committee was right. It should be uh, two out, one in. Um, and th an awful lot could be achieved through that. So I think it's important whilst... I think probably now we do feel that statute is needed to underpin the system. 
that we could change these things right here and right now just through the Prime Minister making a commitment to better appointment processes. And do you believe that uh, reform would in fact go a long way to restoring trust in the House of Lords? Well, we've referred, Philip's referred to some of the, the, the data. Mm. I mean, I, I referred to the figure earlier about um, the size of the House. We did a survey last year uh, in the summer uh, where we asked whether the Prime Minister should appoint members of the House of Lords or whether an independent body should appoint members of the House of Lords. And people were asked to choose between the two. Mm. Uh, 6% chose Prime Minister and 58% chose independent body, and the others were either saying don't know or um, agree, disagree with both equally. And likewise on the numbers, you know, 3% wanted the Prime Minister to decide, wanted there to be no limit on the numbers, and 65% wanted there to be a cap of no bigger than the House of Commons. So, you know, it's not... It's not going to be a panacea. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to make everybody suddenly think that the House of Lords is wonderful and the most legitimate thing in the world. But uh, given those figures, I think it would be very much in line with what the public want and would go some way to restoring trust, certainly. I think the key point there is go some way. It's necessary but not sufficient because there's a much wider issue of trust in politics anyway. Uh, and, and the problem is that people evaluate politics not on the basis of what the two houses do, it's not what members do collectively in scrutinising government or the work of committees, it's what members do individually, so it's actually conduct that actually matters, so raising standards is at the heart of it. So it can certainly make a contribution to, res to establishing some degree of trust, given there clearly isn't that in the existing process, so I think it's absolutely crucial to helping to bolster public confidence in the work of the House. So the problem isn't the work of the House, it's how it's seen outside, particularly in terms of how members get there and at times what the individual members get up to. So we've got other issues to address, but I think this is uh, essential. And, and what do you believe the priorities should be? Uh, appointing better members of the House of Lords, enabling to... Uh, enabling the House to discharge its functions better, increasing its legitimacy, uh, or increasing trust? I mean, th these are all <coughs> important objectives. Which would you say are the top priority? Well, I don't think it's... Uh, well, I'm not sure it's clear. I think it's a case of A equals B plus C. Um, <laughs> in the sense of if you get better members, it impacts on the legitimacy and trust. So where does legitimacy come from? Where does trust come from? So I think it, it is focusing on getting better members in the sense of the qualifications but the process by which they are chosen so I think that leads in to then legitimacy uh, and trust better and fewer I yes add. yes okay. <laughs> thank you very much quality rather than quantity thank you uh, as a, well, a theme of quality uh, <laughs> to, go, to get a final set of questions I think from uh, Tom Randall please uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've just got some questions on HOLAC itself, but I appreciate that's been the sort of theme during your evidence mm. so far. Um, HOLAC's current role is to review the probity of potential new members of the House of Lords. Do you think they do that effectively? I think they do do that effectively. But, yeah. um, the problem is that um, their recommendations are not enforceable and that their remit is so narrow. So I think within the narrow yes. remit that they have, they perform their function very well. Uh, it, it's a shame that the Prime Minister can override the recommendations, and it's a shame that they don't have a wider remit. No, I agree completely. I think HOLAC does a very good job within the remit it, it's given. Um, so I have no criticisms at all of HOLAC. I think it's a, uh, a thoroughly worthwhile uh, uh, body. As Meg says, it's expanding what it does, giving it greater... Uh, powers expanding that uh, remit. It's, it's demonstrated it, it can do um, uh, uh, a good job. I've got com very confidence in the body itself. It's really enabling it to do more than it presently does. So, so the new chair, Baroness Deitch, has suggested two changes, advising on suitability assessed against Northern principles and the production of a suitability statement. Um, do you think that would aid in the review of candidates and do you think that would have a substantive impact on improving the quality of membership of the, the House? I, I, I do. I think yes. that those, I, yeah. I, you know, I, as I said, I agreed with the great majority of what Baroness Deitch said to you. Um, they're very soft controls yeah. in a sense, aren't they? You know, there's nothing, it's not radical, this. 
in particular the transparency point, you know, that there should have to be a published statement by the party leader as to why they think this person is suitable uh, to go into the House of Lords and that the person themselves, I don't know whether there'd be a collaboration on that statement, it would be a one mm. statement, or whether the person themselves would issue their own statement. You know, this, 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 this is crazy that this doesn't exist. Surely, it's, ha it's hardly too much to ask. You're being appointed to a seat in the legislature and there should be some statement of why it is that you, that you deserve that. Um, and yes, I mean, it might be interesting to see those statements for a, a few people who've been appointed in, in, in recent years. You know, if you can't put up a decent case in writing for why you should be in the House of Lords, maybe you shouldn't be in the House of Lords. <laughs> um, and then the, 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 I guess the, um, the suitability checking would be done in some way on the basis of those statements and maybe, um, maybe also on the basis of interview. Because, of course, I mean, the, the process that... Another thing, aside from the propriety role that yep. HOLAC has, the other role that it has is choosing members to sit on the cross benches. And it goes through a very, very rigorous process. Mm. You know, uh, people, people can apply, they fill in a form, they get referees, they're invited mm. for a first interview, they're invited for a second interview. They're, they're also sub, uh, obviously subject to all of the propriety checks. But there's a very thorough process of working out whether those people are suitable and they are, you know, we haven't had scandals yeah. about people appointed to the cross benches by the by the House of Lords Appointments Commission. The scandals have all been about people appointed mm. by the party. So yeah. I think we need to edge in that direction with respect to the party mm. appointments. I don't. I'm not suggesting that parties should lose control of who their appointees are, should have them imposed on them by an external body, but they should be subject to scrutiny before they are agreed and there should be more transparency in the process and you know none of that actually requires legislation uh, which is one of the benefits yeah. of that kind of approach a lot could be achieved just by a slight <clears throat> tweak to the procedures no i agree <clears throat> completely and on the last point i think that's absolutely right if the parties know they've got to make a suitability statement that focuses the f mind anyway in thinking about who is actually suitable what would we say about the qualifications of this candidate i agree completely with Meg, because if you look at the, the role of HOLAC at the moment, looking at probity, look at the, um, its website where it lists what it does by way of vetting, then it is very much reactive, just checking in terms of probity rather than suitability. So um, making sure essentially there is no red marks uh, against them rather than why this person, why are they particularly suitable to join the House of Lords? So I think that uh, would be a valuable concentration of the mind. I think publishing a suitability statement, demonstrating why this person would be very good, very good for the individual, so that they can be seen to be qualified, but coming back to the much wider point, the benefit of the House more generally, and public recognition that this person is qualified. So I think enabling the Commission to do that, and for the parties to know, they'd have to explain the suitability uh, of that particular candidate, I think would be a wholly uh, good thing. I can't see any arguments against what Baroness Teach um, advocated. Bob, I wonder if I might bring in David Jones briefly. Yeah, yes, just question. briefly uh, on the points we've just been discussing. Um, how long do you think that process should take? Could it be done in a weekend? Um, well, when you think about what you're looking at, it depends on the individual in terms of the qualifications they've got. The suitability might be uh, fairly uh, uh, apparent. Um, so it's, I just said, it's, it's the rigour of the process which may possibly be uh, done very um, uh, quickly. It's the ability to undertake that scrutiny uh, that's the key thing. And frequently, of course, it has had to be done very yeah. quickly in, in the case of the appointment of ministers. Mm. Um, but that's a slightly, yeah. I, I think that is a slightly different thing. Um, I think the people who there have been controversies about in recent years are not people who have been appointed as ministers. Um, you know, the government is, 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 is putting that person into a quite a high pressure uh, position with lots of responsibilities. They're not putting people in there, you know, um, lightly. No. They think they think quite carefully, and they are looked at for propriety clearly. And we haven't had, a, as far as I can remember, any controversies about people who've gone in via that route. It's some of the others. Yeah, and there is a, as an aside point there with the ministers in the Lords. There's a current <coughs> uh, problem of which we're uh, uh, highly uh, 
uh, aware, um, the sheer number of ministers in the House of Lords who are not paid. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom, back to your question. Um, uh, well, a, fi a final question for me. Um, Professor Law, you said in your previous answer about the, the powers of HOLEP being set out in a letter from the Prime Minister mm. of the day. Mm. So, um, if you both were Prime Minister <laughs> and you were appointing a, a, a new chair of HOLAC and setting out the sort of responsibilities of, of HOLAC in that letter, what, what changes or reforms would you, would you set out um, in, 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 in setting that up? Well, I think I would do what we've, what we've just been discussing in terms of saying don't just look at propriety, look at suitability. I think I would also ask them to monitor diversity, um, which, you know, maybe they do a little, but, but I mean, I, I think Baroness Deitch yeah. was in favour of much more transparency. Yeah. It's a very, uh, I know that you asked her about the resources of the organisation. It is a very, very small organisation, so some of the, these things do have resource constraints, but I think minimally there should be somebody looking at the, you know, gender, ethnic, um, geographical, professional diversity of the House of Lords regularly, just keeping it um, keeping it under review and publishing those results. And I think that HOLAC should do that because that could act as a spur to the political parties to try and work towards closing some of those gaps. Um, even, you know, getting away from the fact that HOLAC can't close them all um, on its own. But I would also like to see commitment on numbers. So I think the Prime Minister could promise HOLAC that it would have 20% of appointments for the crossbenchers. Yeah. That would be healthy uh, and could put it back on a stable footing in terms of how many it's appointing. And of course, even without legislation, the Prime Minister could say, uh, I want to bring the size of the House of Lords down. It's too big. Uh, please, will you help me? Um, by working out, I mean, essentially, I think we need to move from the system that we've always had, whereby the Prime Minister puts in however many he or she wants when they want to, to a system whereby vacancies arise in the House of Lords and somebody calls for nominations to fill those vacancies. So if we had a fixed size, you know, we, we have to deal with a transition period of getting to the 800 plus down to 650 or 600 yeah. or whatever the destination point is. But once you get there, if people die or retire, vacancies arise, and HOLAC would look at it and say, well, who deserves to fill this seat? Is it Labour's turn, or is it the Conservatives' turn, or is this a crossbench one? It would yeah. probably be annual, actually. So you might say, well, there are 12 vacancies this year, and this is the distribution, and go to the parties and ask for the nominations. That would be a much more professional, sensible, rational process. I think it is quite hard, probably, to achieve without... Well, I, d I don't want to put too much of a damper on it. I, th I think you could achieve it without legislation, but it would be more robust if the cap on the size of the House and the very existence of HOLAC was put into statute uh, because it would give it more power to enforce, it would give it more legitimacy. But actually, if the Prime Minister wrote to Ruth Deach tomorrow and said, I've got a target of getting the size of the House of Lords down to 650, through two in, one out, help me do it, I'm sure they could do it. And that would be a huge improvement. No, I agree. I mean, it, 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 it might be it, it, aspirational, so you might need some other steps to do it, but I think uh, one could move in that direction and, and move very um, quickly, because it sends out all the right signals. Um, it would give HOLAC uh, that responsibility, and, and I think if you look at the point about resources, I mean, HOLAC it does a fantastic job on very little money. If you look at the expenditure in its latest report, um, it's very cost uh, efficient in what it does. So, no, I agree completely with what Meg said, and I, I would think that's key as well to the point about uh, not just improving the quality of the House, but how the House is seen, that that key point about having trust in the appointments process, but it would be then ensuring that successive Prime Ministers just continued with that but once you've got it established by one prime minister it's starting to bed in it makes it much more difficult for a successor then to move away uh, from it so moving in the direction Meg's indicated if we could achieve all what she just summarized that would be ideal but achieving some of it would definitely be a step in the right direction and certainly from that perspective that I think is key to your inquiry uh, which is not just improving the quality of the Lords but improving trust in the institution. As I say, it's only part of the process of restoring trust. It's 
not going to enjoy everybody says, oh, it's doing a grand job or anything like that. Uh, but um, it would be a step in the right direction and a necessary mm. step. And the Lords, I think, um, accepts that. Brief coda from John McDonnell. I, Just brief. I can see uh, uh, that the proposal you're putting forward, particularly the two out, one in, will reduce the numbers overall. The problem then becomes on the allocation of who will nominate then for that vacancy, because you have to then have some agreement about what would be the ideal type balance mm. yeah. within the laws of the political representation, and that's where the problem comes, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's one of the trickiest parts, and the yeah. Burns Committee did try to grapple with that. The Burns yeah. Committee set out a formula, you know, is it the perfect formula? I don't know, but it's better than what we've got now, which is no formula at all. Um, so yes, getting an agreement between the parties about what the share between the parties ought to be. The 20% the, 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 the for the yeah. cross benches, I think, is fairly uncontroversial, isn't yeah. it? But the, and particularly, as, as the chair said, um, the, the allocation for the Liberal Democrats could cause um, something of a scrap. And then, of course, you've got the parties that aren't even in there, like the SNP, who don't want to take seats. So yes, getting that agreement is not straightforward. I mean, I would be inclined to say we need to get back to a level playing field. We ought to be back, you know, the, the two main parties ought to be on roughly level pegging, which is where they were actually when Labour left office in 2010. Labour had only just got, um, not a majority, but, but had, I think, surpassed the Conservatives by about nine seats yeah. uh, when Cameron took over, and then Cameron appointed yeah. more than twice yeah. as many Conservatives yeah. as Labour, and, 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 and here we are. So I think we need to get back to something closer to parity yeah. as a starting point, and then we need a formula going forward to, um, to fill seats in, in what people can agree is a fair manner, although that is very much you know, hard to do objectively. Yeah, I think the, if there is a change of government, there's a real potential of escalation. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, there's a yeah. record. I think we recognise yeah. that. That's that's not an issue. It, it just makes sense. It's how you give effect. Part of the process. To it. Yes, yeah. 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 So we need to wrestle with that because we are conscious yeah. of that very point. And Tony yes. Blair, Tony Blair governed, I think, through the whole of his premiership with fewer Labour peers mm. than there were Conservative peers, um, and 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 that was very quickly sort of over, overturned. And there have been many more Conservatives than Labour. You know, it is possible to govern with a smaller number of peers. But it doesn't seem very fair. No, and it takes time because Labour did eventually overtake the Conservatives. Eventually. Eventually, eventually yes, yeah, so you could try and move more quickly. Mm. But I mean, the, the, the key point you're making, yes, there will be an acceptance of that. This makes sense. It's the formula do we do it on uh, the average of seat, uh, yeah. seats or seats votes. and votes. Yeah, um, yeah. and yeah. Ha over how many. I mean, I, uh, I, th yeah. I think you need a starting formula probably, which is yeah. based on several general elections mm. you sort of you know where would where would the house of lords be now if we'd had a formula based on general election votes for the last what's your start point though if you said 10 years it would be tilted towards the conservatives if you say 20 years you know do you say let's take the balance of general election votes over the last 30 years it's complicated but something needs to be done yeah I mean, maybe we just gave something that's rough and ready, but it's yeah. in the direction oh. of yeah. parity, I would Parity. say. I, I think the, the note that something needs to be done <laughs> is a <laughs> fine conclusion. In all seriousness, to this morning's session, can I thank Professor Russell and Professor uh, the Lord Norton for um, the very engaging and interesting, uh, almost, as I say, seminar. I know you've made written submissions, but if there's any further you wish to um, let us know, please do write. But for the moment, thank you both very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Order, order. <laughs>